Thank you, exceptional friends. I don't know of a better prelude piece this morning than make me a channel of your peace. I know pastors all over the city redid their sermons yesterday, as I did, and prayed and struggled over what to say in the wake of another violent hate crime, this time in our own community. We're rocked by this as a city. We're angry and fearful, sickened, saddened. Tragedies like this stir up all kinds of emotions. And it's hard to imagine how the people of Squirrel Hill and the people of Pittsburgh will heal. But I am drawing some comfort today for a few reasons. First of all, in the knowledge that people all over the country are praying. As often happens in tragedies, people band together and pray. But also, I see this as a chance for us to really show the love of Jesus Christ as a church. And so I've been asking God, how might we, here at Beulah Church, stand with our Jewish neighbors or any people that are the targets of hate crimes and injustice. And I pray that God will show us, as a church in the days ahead, how we are to respond in practical ways. The chapel will be open for prayer Monday and Tuesday of this week, from 9 a.m. to 7 p.m. It'll just be open for you to come and pray quietly on your own, there will be a few times throughout the day when someone will be there to lead in prayer. I will be there from 9 to 10 tomorrow morning and from 6 to 7 tomorrow night. And then our prayer elder, Jeff Jelpe, will be there from noon to 1, both Monday and Tuesday. I'm also encouraged because there's lots of evidence that God is in control. It's interesting because the scripture text that is going to be read today is a text I planned months ago. And the introit that the choir will be singing for in a few minutes is very appropriate as well. It's called O Day of Peace. And this is the first verse. O day of peace that dimly shines through all our hopes and prayers and dreams Guide us to justice, truth, and love. Delivered from our selfish schemes, may swords of hate fall from our hands. Our hearts from envy find release, till by God's grace our warring world shall see Christ's promise reign of peace. That is our prayer. We come now into the presence of God to worship him, to worship Jesus Christ, remembering that he is the light of the world. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome it. Just three brief announcements this morning. First of all, tonight from 4 to 7, the spaghetti dinner, an opportunity for us as a church family to help out the Graybill family. Next Saturday, the pancake breakfast. And then next Sunday, don't forget, set your clocks back one hour. You might remember from last week that during this stewardship season, we're looking at how we can glorify God in every aspect of life. The stewardship committee has utilized the gifts of our own Luke Keebler to produce a series of videos to show how Beulah Church seeks to glorify God in all of our ministries here. So today, the video is glorifying God in our mission and outreach. A faithful community of believers has worshiped and served their Lord Jesus Christ from the Church on the Hill known as Beulah Presbyterian Church. Over the years, 
The church has grown and changed in many ways, but in every way, guided by the Holy Spirit, Beulah endeavors to glorify God. In our worship, service, and study, we say, to God be the glory. So my name is Tim Bossy. Uh, my name is Jeff Jelby. Uh, well, my name is Diane Falk. We uh, engage in international uh, missions, uh, national missions and local missions, and also try to um, encourage and uh, get the church involved with uh, other missional outreach projects that we're involved with. So we're trying to be not just uh, mission supporting, but missional in terms of how we approach what we do. Nora Gates has been on the Mission Outreach Support Team for a number of years and uh, is very actively engaged with some of the mission work that uh, we support in Magoe with our sister church in Malawi. And the first mission trip I ever went on, we went down to Mississippi, and the leader down there said, you're not down here to rebuild houses, you're down here to listen to these people, you're down here to talk to these people, and you're down here to bring the love of Jesus Christ to these people. Open Hands uh, was the brainchild of Michael Stanton. He started this 10 years ago trying to renovate homes in Garfield and East Liberty. So he's literally just gutting houses and trying to do the work. And slowly started building up a volunteer pool. And among those are uh, Pat Cost and Mike Adams. My name's Mike Adams. I've been going to Open Hands for about four years. Uh, I usually volunteer with the Wednesday crew. I knew Beulah Church sponsored them financially, so I decided I'll go down with Pat and give this a try and just got involved. I hope I've had an impact on them. They certainly have had an impact on me. The people you work with are uh, just wonderful people. I look forward to going. It's a great experience. We start the morning with prayer. We have lunch, we have prayer at lunch. So it's just very fulfilling. Uh, Garfield Community Farms is an organization that started up a few years ago in the Garfield area to uh, really purchase vacant properties in the Garfield area and uh, turn that into urban gardens. The youth group go on a regular basis. Alex Rosanik takes people down there. I know that uh, Annie McGee has gone uh, down on a regular basis. I've been down on a uh, regular basis as well. Haiti sort of came through Alex through the Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh Kids Foundation. The first trip was five of us went down just as sort of a hey what's going on down here kind of a thing to see what we could do what, what we could be a part of and then from there we've had several other trips after that where people have gone down and um, you see the area you spend time with the kids and you basically get on it's a it's a mission of presence you get on and you're just there i do think we've had a very positive impact on the community not just internationally with our uh, missions that we support in other countries we still maintain an active relationship with our sister church in Magoe. we periodically have people who come from there to visit with us here and share in our worship experiences here. We also have uh, continued to send people from our church over to Magoe and continue that relationship. When it's done right, and it, one of the themes with most that we've been looking at in the past year is uh, looking at the book When Helping Hurts and trying to do help in a way that doesn't hurt the community we're trying to help. Uh, there's a couple there's several kinds of mission work. There's the acute thing, like the trip to New Jersey or the trips to uh, Mississippi, where we were doing immediate work after a hurricane to try and get people back into their houses. It's just, you know, where the job's too big for them and they need some help. But the other kind of work that really appeals to me is I don't want to do handouts. I don't want to renovate somebody's house. So that's what appeals to me about open hand and that type of mission work is we're really going after the basic problem and getting that person into a, a place where they're financially stable and they're able to get out of this nasty cycle. Go on a mission trip, that's what I would say. <laughs> when the opportunity arises, go on a mission trip.
Good morning. Happy Reformation Sunday, and please join me in the call to worship. I love you, O Lord, my strength. I call upon the Lord, who is worthy to be praised, so I shall be saved from my enemies. It is you, like my land, the Lord, my God, lights up my heart. The Lord lives, blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation. Dear God, we praise you that you are the God of truth and that you are eternal, unchangeable, and infinite in your truth. You continually speak to our hearts the reality of what is true. We praise you that you are the way, the truth, and the life, and that you've enlightened us with that reality. We praise you for how we encounter your truth each day in our experiences and in your word in conversations with friends. Thank you for continuing to speak to our hearts so we can know the way and have life. We praise you for the reality 
of how you say in your word that you shall know the truth and the truth shall set us free. Amen. God calls us to walk in the light openly, generously through our lives and community. And yet we struggle to live so transparently. Let us reflect on the ways in which we block the light of Christ. Okay, please join me in the litany of confession. When we hide the light of our talents and do not use them for the common good, when we fear to take a stand in the light of justice and hide in the shadow of fear, when we are less than truthful and cast shadows of doubt across relationships, Christ, lifted up to draw people to God, often offers forgiving grace and welcome into a community of trust, abundance, and hope. Let us give thanks for the mercy of God. The scripture reading this morning is from 1 John, chapter 1, verses 5 through 10. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light, as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sins. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. This is the word of the Lord. When I was a little girl, probably about eight or nine, my family visited a tourist site in Missouri. We went on a group tour 
in a cave. I cannot tell you how much I dislike dark, closed-in underground places, but I went with my family, and at one point in the tour, we came to this large cavern. And the tour guide told us that in a moment or two, they were going to turn out all the lights so that we could have the experience of being in total darkness. Now, I am sure that the darkness didn't last any more than a minute, but it went on forever for me. And I was so relieved when they finally turned the lights back on. It's time that someone turned on the lights in our world, in our nation, and in our community. Because the darkness is getting a little overwhelming. And I'm talking specifically about the darkness of hatred, violence, and the pain and suffering that comes in the face of hate crimes and other injustices that we human beings are inflicting upon one another. Pervasive, insidious evil has shattered God's design for life on this planet, and it affects all of us, and it affects the whole creation. From the glorious radiance of Eden, where humanity walked in deep intimacy with God, all of creation was plunged into darkness when disobedience, when sin, entered the world. And this darkness that we live in today is nothing like the kind of life that God meant for us. But in spite of all appearances, friends, I'm here today to tell you, God has not abandoned us. Can I get an amen? amen? We, as his people, must believe, even in the darkest of times, that God is still with us. He is not absent, he is not silent, and he is very much at work in the world. All throughout scripture, God gives us promises that the darkness is not going to win out. In the Old Testament, during the darkest times in Israel's history, God would send prophets to remind the people that he was with them and that there was hope. And the prophets often used this imagery of light and darkness, such as Isaiah, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. Light symbolizes God. It symbolizes his word, his wisdom, his truth, and righteousness. And darkness symbolizes everything that is anti-God, wickedness, evil, violence, hatred, death, but always Always in scripture, we are told that there is no darkness that can even equal the power of God's light. God is sovereign over darkness. And when the day of the Lord comes, that time of God's ultimate judgment, then darkness and evil will be eradicated forever. But here we are here and now, and yet we are not alone. And we are not left in the darkness. Because the light of God in the person of Jesus Christ has dawned upon us and is with us. Second Corinthians 4 talks about the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. With the coming of Christ, God, light himself, stepped into our dark world, and he hasn't left. So there is always reason for hope. In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Friends, there is no darkness that can snuff out 
the light of Christ in this world. Today's scripture passage, and as I said, chosen months ago, tells us that as followers of Jesus Christ, we are to walk in the light. And I know that some of us come here this morning and wonder, what can we do in the face of such terrible evil and darkness in our world? Can we make a difference as people of light? Well, I hope that you will say yes to that. Because I believe that we can make a difference, each in our own way, each in our own sphere of influence with the people that we interact with every day. First of all, we have to make the choice to get out of the darkness and walk into the light. We have to choose to step into the light. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. God's salvation given to us in Jesus Christ puts us on the right path. We have the light so we can see the right way to walk. In our scripture reading for today, verses 6 to 8, John said, If we say that we have fellowship with God while we are walking in the darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. By the blood of Christ, we are set free from the darkness, from evil. And then we begin this lifelong journey of being transformed into the image of Christ. But all along the way, we have to do our part and stay in the light. This lifelong transformation comes about as we continue to submit to the Lordship of Christ in every aspect of life. In John chapter 11, Jesus said, Those who walk during the day do not stumble because they see the light of this world. But those who walk at night stumble because the light is not in them. We do not need to be stumbling around in the darkness. We have the light of Jesus Christ in us. But it's not enough to just know the truth of God, to just know about Jesus Christ like it's some kind of philosophical or religious ideal. We must also walk in the light through righteous living, and by being courageous enough to shine his light in the dark places of our world. People ask this question, why is there evil and suffering in the world? And they're thinking and talking about evil like it's just an exterior reality. Evil happens out there because there are evil people in the world. But friends, evil and sin is an interior reality in humanity. The problem of evil and darkness begins in the human heart, in every person, even a Christian. We can allow the darkness to remain in us. Last week, we looked at Romans chapter 12, where Paul wrote that we are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And we learned that this means body, mind, and will, and behavior. We are to live in holiness in every aspect of our lives. That's part of what it means to walk in the light. John wrote, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. Well, another way of putting that is 
God is good, and evil can have no place beside him. We can't claim to have intimate relationship with God if we're still in the darkness of sin, because sin is a barrier to communion with God. Of course, walking in the light does not mean that we will succeed in being sinless, but it does mean that we are aware of how sinful and broken we are. And we're not afraid to look at the darkness in our own hearts and cry out to God for his mercy, forgiveness, and healing. And we're not afraid to make changes so that the darkness that might be present in us will be driven out by the light of Christ. More and more, I am becoming convinced that we as Christians cannot allow darkness in our hearts that might develop someday into full-blown hatred or prejudice or bigotry. People in our society have become so intolerant, so angry towards others who look different, who believe something different, who pray in different ways. Our witness, the witness of the Church of Jesus Christ, is damaged when we allow these kinds of things to remain in our hearts. And when we sit in silence and tolerate it when we hear it from other people. Christians have got to start speaking out. We've got to go beyond the nice thoughts and prayers we extend to those who've experienced tragedy. We've got to take a visible stand in this encroaching darkness. We have to directly speak out against hatred and bigotry. We can no longer be quiet. We can no longer give affirmation to it in any way whether it's hate that is expressed in public or in the smallest and most subtle, racist, and hate-filled joke. We need to say enough. The light of Christ will shine in us as we are willing to bravely stand with those who suffer injustice and hatred. A mother took her little boy to see a famous cathedral. And on the windows, in the stained glass, were pictures of various Christians from throughout history. And as the little boy was watching the sun shining through the stained glass windows, he asked his mother, who are the people in these windows? And she said, they're saints. The little boy looked at the windows and he said, well, now I know what saints are. They are people who let the light shine through. That little boy got it right. That's what a saint is. That's what we as Christians, people of the light, are. We are people who let the light of Christ shine through. And we do that so that people can see and experience the love and the light and the hope we have in Jesus Christ. And we pray that through our witness, they will come to know that light and love and hope for themselves. These are times of great challenge. But we cannot allow ourselves to be overcome by the darkness and get buried in fear and doubt. We cannot keep our eyes focused only on the dark things that happen in this world. Remember the gospel story where Jesus invited Peter to step out of the boat and walk on the water 
to him. So Peter did. He kept his eyes on Jesus. He walked across the water, but then he looked down. He looked down at the stormy waves at the sea, and he began to sink. When he kept his eyes on Jesus, he was brought to safety. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. And in the midst of all the emotions that we feel about this tragedy, we need to take our refuge in Christ because he is a shelter from the harsh reality of the darkness. So at times we have to rest in him. But it's also important to pour out our hearts to him. And in the past we've talked about how often in scripture we see that God's people poured out their anger, their grief, their confusion and sorrow in times of darkness. It's called lament. It's when we give voice to these stormy emotions within us, and it's healthy to do it. But also in times of loss, deep community grief and loss, it's important that we take time to come together in community. As we saw last night, hundreds of people gathered for the candlelight vigil. And we too must come together and pray, not just coming together to pray though, it's coming together to be healed, to be comforted as we experience shared sorrow. So we need to keep our focus on what's important. And what's important is Jesus, the light of the world. If we keep our eyes on him, then we will not lose hope, and we will be able to live as people of light and hope. So to walk in the light means that we have to look within ourselves and drive out any vestiges of darkness in our own lives but then we need to courageously live out what it means to be a Christian by meeting violence with peace, hatred and anger with love, wrongdoing with truth and forgiveness, and unjust treatment of others by standing up for them, by standing up for what is right and just and true. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill cannot be hidden. No one, after lighting a lamp, puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to the whole house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. May God give each one of us the courage to shine in the darkness in visible, prominent ways so that we may glorify our Father in heaven. Amen. Several months ago, Nora Gates sent me a link to a brand new hymn. And Bill and I have kept this hymn kind of set aside, waiting for the right time to sing it. Today is the day. So we're not going to sing the hymn that is listed in the bulletin, but instead we're going to sing a hymn that is going to be listed on the screen. It's called, If We Just Talk of thoughts and prayers. It is a familiar tune. I think you'll be able to follow along. But if not, pay attention to the words. Let's sing together, stand as you are able, if we just talk of thoughts and prayers.
Is Debbie Wilson here? Not yet. Debbie Wilson uh, is going to share uh, what we're calling a glory to God moment, uh, a testimony in a sense. Um, but since she's probably still in the nursery, I'll go get her. But Greg, would you come and lead us in prayer? And so then after the Lord's Prayer, uh, Bill, we will have um, Debbie's testimony. Please pray with me. Lord, pray that you help us to make a difference in this world with your light. Help us to be saints who let <clears throat> the light of Christ shine through us. On this Reformation Sunday, we remember Martin Luther and the other reformers and how they renewed the church to get back to the faith once delivered to the saints. Help us to share that with everyone possible. We also pray that the Catholic Church will get back to the simplicity of the gospel of being saved by grace through faith. And I pray that you help everyone who's been hurt in the Catholic Church to look to you. Uh, we just thank you for your gospel and your grace. And we pray that you bring uh, the church to uh, repentance and reconciliation. Lord, we also want to cast our anxieties upon you, for you care about us. We pray, Lord, that you help us to reach out to those who've been touched and, and devastated by what happened at the Tree of Life uh, Synagogue. On this day, we come before you with broken hearts in many different ways. We ask you that you touch all the members of the Tree of Life Synagogue and their families with your grace and healing in the aftermath of what happened. Uh, we pray that you help them to look towards you and to embrace you and that they will find grace to help them in time of need. Pray that uh, the people in the community would reach out to them as well. Lord, we pray that you help us to be courageous enough to shine your light into the darkness, especially in times like these. We continue to pray also, Lord, for the Frost family and their tragic loss, that you give them peace and grace and help them to see your light. Uh, we also pray that you would bless the uh, spaghetti dinner today and touch the Graybill family with your healing grace. We also pray that you would touch Ken Molk and Kelly and Ingrid Miskus and any others in the congregation who are hurting and suffering. We just want to lift up everyone in their uh, time of need. We'd ask that you would do what you say in Psalm 147.3, that you would heal the broken in heart and bind up their wounds. Many people have been wounded, Lord, and we pray that you would just bind their wounds. We pray for wisdom for our national leaders as they deal with peoples who are coming from other countries, such as with the huge caravan that it's on its way to the United States. We just pray for, for wisdom and grace and compassion. Please touch the prayer families of the week with a special touch of your grace, Lord, that they would sense your presence. Pray that you touch Bill and Phyllis Brownlee, Carl, Gina, Cole, and Julia Delacondro, and Janet Grove. Please touch them and help them to know your peace and love as well. And now we pray as you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. So I was asked by Carolyn to um, speak about what I do for Beulah. And my immediate reaction was that I don't speak in front of people. And then my next reaction was I don't even do that much for Beulah. Uh, when I started coming here as a child and then as a teen with my friend Lauren Smith, and then as an adult in 2013, after a lot of medical issues, I never imagined that by 2018, I would be a member, an employee, had another child and had my children baptized here and been so active with Beulah. So I guess if I had to say why I'm active with Beulah, I guess I'd have to say because it's just me. I don't look at it as serving. I look at it as treating others as I would like to be treated 
and to be a part of something that I hope my children and their families will be a part of for years to come. I try to put a smile on everybody's face. I try to serve at Beulah because it makes me happy, makes me feel like I have a worth, makes me feel like I'm doing something good in this crazy world. The things I do, I do just because it's me. I love to be involved with the children's ministry and be a part of what my kids are doing. I love helping at VBS sports camp and the Old Breathe program or whatever may be going on. For 2019, I'll be a part of the leadership and nominating team. I love to be able to send someone a card who may be sick or just down or to just say hello. If someone's going through a tough time, when I can, I like to bring a meal to them. I like to go visit people that may be in the hospital or bring them something to make them smile. I like to listen to people talk, and if they mention something specific and I can find that specific thing for them, I like to try to find it and surprise it with them later. I like to be there for people if they need me, even if it's just to talk or listen. I feel like I don't give to Beulah because I'm not able to give a big check to Beulah, or if anything, sometimes. I'm told by many that I have a special gift, but I don't see this gift. To me, to glorify God requires a full commitment to him. I know that I don't, I stray, I sin, but as I read in Colossians 3.23, I read, whatever you do, work out it with all your heart as working for the Lord. To honor or glorify God in everything includes having a strong work ethic, even when we work for those who we do not like or labor in difficult situations. I do feel like I do this. I give everything in me with my full heart. I may not be able to give financially, but I need to see that I give myself in other ways. Ways that I look at as just being me, but maybe these are the gifts that I've been given. To love full heartedly, to help make someone smile, to be there for anybody, and to always help when I can. But in all honesty, Beulah has been there for me far beyond what I could ever do for Beulah. Beulah, as a family, has been there for me to help me and my family grow within the church, become more active in the church. They've put Dominic through summer camp, sent my family to the January getaway, been there to talk through life problems, help me with financial problems, been there to help my friends in crisis, help through medical issues, brought meals to my house, talked to me, cried with me, texted with me, put me through financial peace class, and then hired me as a nursery caregiver. The list goes on and on. This is very hard for me to say because one day I'd like to be the one on the giving side. Sometimes I feel like my life will never be in order, but with God I know I will be okay no matter what comes my way. This is my family. Ultimately, I try to honor God with the life he has given to me. We are free to make personal choices in life, but we are not to do anything that causes another person to stumble or sin in his own walk on, with God. We are to seek the good of others. Believers serve the Lord both through their personal lives and in their actions towards others. Glorifying God in everything to me means we honor him in our thoughts and our actions. Our thoughts are to be set on the things God and the word of God. When we focus on God's word, we know what is right and can follow through with doing what is right. To glorify God in everything, we must exercise faith, love, deny ourselves, and be filled with spirit and offer ourselves as living sacrifices to God. Every area of life is important to evaluate and live it to its fullest for the glory and honor of God. We should strive to, for every thought and deed to bring joy to our Father in heaven. So whatever your gift may be, use it, cherish it, and be blessed in this life on earth. To God be the glory. As you go now, shining the light of Jesus in this dark world, take courage. Because Jesus said, be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I bless you as you go. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.